All right, so normally, Spencer, I would say welcome to New York, but for you, yeah. it's welcome back to New York. Yeah. Have you officially settled in fully back in New York and with the team, of course? Uh, settled in back to New York? Not at all. I'm still in a hotel, um, living the life of a guy that got traded a couple weeks ago. But in terms of the team, they've done a great job welcoming me, and a lot of the you know, front office do the same, so it's, it's right back to business. So what was the process, though, of easy back into the team? Was it easier than you thought, harder than you thought, about the same? Ooh. Um, I don't know if I had any explicit thoughts. I think um, when I got traded to Dallas, it was already kind of an established, like, culture, hierarchy, all that other stuff. Um, with the way the trade deadline went down with the Nets, you knew that it was just going to all be new. So mm -hmm. I don't think I really had expectations. It was just kind of like, let's see where this goes. Yeah. Tell me three ways that you are a different player now than you were the first time around. Ooh. Um, I think I'm stronger. Um, obviously, every time you go through the rehab process, you learn little nuances about your body. Um, so last time Nets fans saw me, I was uh, hurt. I think um, basketball IQ's gotten higher. Just uh, being able to experience different organizations, different uh, philosophies. Um, and although it doesn't show right now in the last like 10 games, I, I've been a better three-point shooter. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were yeah. going to say that. Why do you think it's not um, showing at the moment for you? Uh, just changing scenery, uh, types of looks. Um, you know, when I was in Dallas, I shot a lot of catch-shoot threes, a lot of corner threes, too. Um, right now, I've unfortunately had to take a lot of grenades and like late clock bombs and stuff like that, which obviously... Uh, typically isn't good for your percentage. Yeah, but I will also say, people gotta understand, you gotta respect those late heaves because a lot of guys yeah. don't wanna do it yeah. for that exact reason. Well, exactly, I mean, I would say if I probably took out the late heaves, I'd probably be shooting mid-30s right now, to be honest, but um, it's about winning the game, and if I can give ourselves a chance, a, a little bit better chance, I'm gonna do it. Great, okay, so with Bridges right now, yeah. tell me what you thought about him before he was your teammate, and what you think of him now that he's your teammate. Um, Pre-teammate, elite defender, um, seemed like a high character guy. Um, he always ran a little curl play with Phoenix. Um, and you knew he could catch and shoot. And he actually talked a little, uh, well, I can't curse on this, you right? Can oh, he talked a little shit, too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, we actually uh, had a couple back and forth before uh, when we played Phoenix. But, um, so did you like him? Like, was yeah. it all just friendly shit talking? It, it was friendly. So I was, I was actually uh, busting the ass one time. And, uh, he, because uh, we were getting the switch, because yeah. obviously he was a primary defender, and he came to me and was like, oh, man, you you know you can't score on me. Why you keep calling for the switch? I was like, bro, I'm old. Stop the reverse psychology shit. I don't, <laughs> I don't play that. You know what I mean? So it was, it was funny. It was just a yeah. light back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but now, I mean, we're, we're seeing him develop into a, a premier, probably number one, number two option as a, as a, as a scorer. Um, his ability to get to the mid-range and knock down shots is, is elite. Obviously, there was so much news surrounding the trade uh, that led to you being with the Nets. Yeah. A lot of moving parts. Definitely. When you step back, look on it now, do you feel like it's a trade that worked out for all parties? Um, I think it's something that the, t the tale of the trade won't be told this season. You know, I think if you look at it from Dallas' side, they got star power, right? They got a, another really high-octane uh, player to, to pair with Luka. Um, and, you know, hopefully it works out for them. If he doesn't resign, though, and does go to the Lakers, for example, which everybody always talks about, then it's probably not the best move for them. Mm -hmm. um, for the Nets, I think, you know, with the moves that they made, they uh, kind of got to restructure their roster um, more in line with probably who the front office and, you know, ownership group kind of wanted to have, which I think has been well documented. Um, and they also got a plethora of picks, which, you know, if they want to stay in win-now mode, they've got a lot of guys that are in that kind of uh, age range and caliber. And then you take the picks, you go try to find the guy, mm -hmm. and, you know, you go from there. So for someone who's been to a few different spots, yeah, do you ever get used to being traded? No. No, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't think so. I mean, for the most part, I've pretty much been traded twice. You know, uh, obviously... Uh, Dallas and then um, back to Brooklyn. I mean, mm -hmm. technically speaking, four times because DC was a sign in yeah. trade and stuff like that, but not so much. Um, 
it's just situations where a max player wanted to go. And I was in that tier two where like, hey, he's, mm -hmm. he's a good talent. His contract plus another contract makes sense. And, you know, that, that's how it works. It was really interesting for me just obviously prepping for this, learning more about your journey, because it really has been interesting. And there's been a number of ups and downs and certain things that you've had to deal with in the NBA. How important is it to feel wanted in yeah. this league? Uh, opportunity, situation, or everything. Yeah. You know, um, I think there's, there's a reason why a lot of the top picks are, you know, max guys and things of that nature and a reason why a lot of second round guys end up in China or whatever what have you um, opportunities everything and so to your point that feeling wanted and somebody uh, believing in you and giving you a chance to make mistakes um, is how your your career can flourish I mean if if Kenny does and Kenny and Sean Marks don't give me an opportunity what is that now seven years ago mm -hmm. so, oof. <laughs> oof. league age you in dog years but uh, <laughs> Then I mean I'm not sitting here today. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you felt unwanted in the league? Shoot, like week two in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about no, Detroit? It was tough. Uh, you know, he just he was he was committed to playing vets, and I was a guy. What that like Steve Blake? Steve Blake. Yeah. 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 John Lucas, Steve Blake, guys like that. Um, which you know. Having been in the league now a long time, you understand like on the margins, maybe they gave you, you know, an extra charge taken or extra heady play. But obviously, I'm biased. I think I'm more talented than they are. Um, I don't think many people probably disagree with that. But you know, I was a young guy, 20 years old, coming off ACL, and you know, he it, he was a guy that wanted to make the the playoffs and you know do what was right for his job. So, uh, coach, would that have been Stan Van Gundy? Gundy? Yeah. Have you ever been able to have conversations later with Stan Van Gundy about the player that you became? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, one of my last games in Dallas, he was doing a broadcast, and he, we sat down for probably about ten minutes. He asked like what he could have done differently, and you know, it's his job as a coach to cultivate talent and not, you know, have it kind of go left the way that it did. So, you know, I, I, I really appreciate that, man. Yeah. It's, it's water under the bridge for sure, and, and honestly. I've given him his kudos before in terms of shaping my work ethic, in terms of how to approach being a true pro in the league. Um, you know, being two hours early to practice and staying hour, two hours after, and just being diligent about your habits and, and your work. Mm -hmm. Wait, I love that. So, because I don't think that a lot of players and coaches are able to have that moment yeah. of kind of reflection and discourse yeah. about how things went or how things didn't go. So how did you all sit down to talk? He was doing the broadcast. Did you come up to him? He came up to you? Nah, he actually pulled me aside. So I did my pregame shooting and, you know, he was at his booth and uh, he, he pulled me to the side. was like, I got a couple questions for you. And I was like, all right, like, what, what you got? You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and we sat down and chopped it for about 10 minutes. And, you know, that was, it was, it was a really actually cool moment for me, even though it was mm -hmm. something that, I probably let go a couple years ago or several years ago, but it's almost a, a closure moment. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a moment of validation too. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like, so I, I read a quote, um, you were talking to a reporter from CBS and you said, people don't understand the mentality of a player who has been told he wasn't good enough at every step of yeah. his basketball life. Yeah. That's how you feel your journey has gone. Oh, all the time. Yeah. Every, every every single point in time. I mean, oh, sorry about hitting the mic, but yeah. uh, I mean, even now, right? Like, you get traded for a max guy, you get thrown to a, a unique situation. Um, I know a lot of Nets fans have championship expectations still for a group that's only been together a month. Um, you know, y'all lighten up my Twitter mentions and all that <laughs> stuff after every loss. Um, at the same time, on the bright side, you know, if you extrapolate out my 15 games over the course of a season, I'd be top like three in assists. You know what I mean? So there's there's always positives to take from it. And you, when you've always been in that underdog or uh, not as ballyhooed position, you got to take the positives out of the situation. Mm -hmm. So even now, you still have these moments of feeling like people don't think you're good enough. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Every 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 year, all the time, like it, it's part of it. I mean, with the entertainment industry at the end of the day and there's a certain sex appeal to 
uh, certain guys' names, and that's not uh, the life I live. Mm -hmm. So when you have these moments, where do you get the reassurance from? The facts of the situation. You know, I mean, there was, I had a, a run like three years in a row where I was like a top five ISO guy. I mean, even last year I was as well. Um, you know, my time in Dallas was like number one in points per possession, isolations, and then, you know, like I said, if you extrapolate my Brooklyn time already, I'd be top three in assists mm -hmm. in the league. Like, it's just things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can say what you want, but numbers don't lie. So, yes, I have improvement to make in terms of uh, three-point shooting in this time period, but that's a positive that I take from it. So just to further define, like, this feeling and this emotion that you're describing, mm -hmm. right, what kind of player do you feel like people think you are and what kind of player do you think you think you are? And, you know, what's that difference between the two? Oh, uh, mass, are we talking about mass appeal? Are we talking about coaches and front offices? Or are we talking about just personally, you're all three? I think, yeah, I would say a mix of all of it. Because if, if what you're yeah. referring to is a feeling of not feeling like you're good enough, I'm sure that is coming from a variety of like sources. Yeah. So. If we kind of had a medley of those and averaged it out, what do you yeah. think people think and what do you think? Okay, okay. Um, I think people think I'm a dude that's crazy. Like, in my mind, I think I'm uh, number one or them just not on – I think I'm a number one in my mind, but I'm not on that level or whatever it is. Like, it's, it's usually this, like, really split opinion type of situation. Um, which, and I'm talking about more like mass media and stuff, then uh, front offices that have gotten to know me. I think Dallas and Brooklyn obviously spend a lot of time that they kind of know uh, who I am and also how I view myself. I think, you know, depending upon the type of superstar I'm playing with, either a second or third option on a, on a championship type team. Um, I mean, Drew Holiday in that sense would be something that people would like probably stick to and be like, oh, okay, like I get it, right? Like mm -hmm. an opportunity to make an all-star team here or there, maybe not. Um, obviously, Drew's a, a very elite defender. I, I'm not the defender that he is, but offensively, like I've been able to do some things that, you know, he's not as good at, as I feel like I am at. And we actually share an agent, so this is nothing that would be <laughs> news to anybody. I'm not taking shots at anybody, but that would be more so in the realm of you know, talent, capacity, all those are things that I put myself in and understand that you put me next to a Giannis or a Luca or whatever, like we probably have a chance to win uh, games at a high level. And, you know, I think uh, Brooklyn understands uh, that really realistic vision. And like I said, they got all the picks to be able to do mm -hmm. stuff like that. So do those opinions that you disagree with, right, has that ever shaken how you view yourself? Um. The only reason it hasn't is just because the noise has been loud from a very young age. So I think that I used to be more angry about it. Um, and as I've gotten older, like, I've gotten a lot more calm with it. Um, so the ferocity of, or, or the feeling of taking it as disrespect um, is, a, is a lot more chill than it used to be. When did you stop being angry with it? Uh, well, I stopped really caring about it to a degree. You know what I mean? Like, I, you, you still do. It's impossible for people to say, like, you know, certain things about you and you not to feel it. But I think um, you have to be, like, okay with your accomplishments and okay with your career and where it's gone, be happy with it, all those other things. And, and to be honest, I'm, like, very proud of my career. Um, considering the odds and, and everything and where I've come from and then also where I think I, I could still go in the next, you know, or back nine of, uh, of this thing. And as you have that internal security with, like, what you've been able to accomplish, like, you know, screwing up some parlays ain't really, like, the biggest thing <laughs> yeah, that yeah, you're worried about. Yeah, you're not concerned about yeah. that. No, I love that you're saying this because there's obviously been a lot of discussion about ring culture and just the way that we value yeah. certain NBA players' accomplishments. And I always say that NBA players have their idea of what success is in their career. Yeah. And if they reach those things, they feel like it is For success. Sure. 
But a lot of the ways NBA players define success is not how fans or mass media define yeah. success. I think that you have to have a very specific sense of security and self to be okay yeah. with what just your definition is. Yeah. So where do you fall on that subject and how there is this major discrepancy yeah. in what players think success is and what everyone else thinks success is? Um, if I was speaking to a player right now, um, I love what you just kind of uh, said and, and lobbed to me because it really is about you and what, what you define as success. Um, I was actually just talking to one of my younger teammates, Dayron Sharp. If you're not top five, and I mean like all time, two years, three years after you're done, they're going to forget about you, bro. Like, let's be real about who we're still talking about. If you didn't change culture like AI or Steph Curry with the threes, or you're not literally Kobe, Mike, Braun, or do we talk about Penny Hardaway? You know what I'm saying? Do we talk about T-Mac? Do we talk about Brandon Roy for real other than injuries? Like, and these are monsters. Like, we're talking about these are dudes. Some of the that, greats. The yeah. greats. You know what I'm saying? Like, if Shaq wasn't on TNT every night, we may not be talking this, about him as much. And he's the most dominant player in history. So, like, you're going to have to define sets for you. And I understand the ring chasing for those guys because – one more ring for Bron can be the difference between him being the GOAT or not. Or I caught Mike, or I caught this guy, or I didn't. For, we people talk about Dame all the time, right? For him, he's not going to be the GOAT regardless. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not going to be that. So if he's cool with his career and he knows that he made the right decision staying in Portland, more power to him. I have no problem with him. And I'm not going to say that he's a worse player for it. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's probably the second best three-point shooting point guard in the history of the game. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and a monster, right? Like, so I, that's that's really the way I view it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I fully understand the method of ring chasing if you're right on that cusp of like, oh, I could overtake Kobe or I could overtake MJ or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're, you know, top 20 and down, yeah. which is basically <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. Bro, it's about you. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and if you respect in the game, then I have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I have no problem with it. But do you think that's a critique of the way we talk about basketball or like a critique of players' mindset about basketball? Does that make sense? Oh, uh, man, I think, again, right, and, I, and this goes back to kind of being the entertainment industry, right? Like, we all have to work in concert with each other. You know, you guys are gonna have storylines that you talk about, um, some that are sensationalized because how you do your job, right? Like part of what made Mike and, and, and drove his narrative and drove some of the star power of that league is the six and oh. Like would we have $100 million contracts if Mike don't do what he does? Like we wouldn't. And we're gonna have to, we'd have to attach something to his narrative. You know what I mean? Like the Mamba mentality, the Kobe's like it's, it's some of that stuff is going to happen, and we do play to win. Like, if you're really a true competitor and, you know what I'm saying, a guy that respects the game, you're going to play the game to win. Um, so I can't say that it's, it's on either party because, like I said, it, it works together, and I understand that this machine is always going to need a narrative, right? It's, it's always going to – like, I use the Cavs and Warriors. Remember, like, at first, Steph Curry was – you know, the, the hero, the David versus Goliath with LeBron. And then once he got KD and everybody, and they, you know, Marvel teamed up, then LeBron became the sympathetic figure. And everybody was like, ah, oh, it's not fair. Like, LeBron doesn't have any stars like that. And, you know, you have to kind of have those moments to appeal to the masses so they can feel involved and you can strike emotional chords that resonate with them. Mm -hmm. But with what you went and, you know, you're talking to a younger teammate about, I think you said with Sharp. Yeah. There has to be this piece that you have to have with yourself and the career to say, listen, I know what I am and what I'm not. Yeah. I know how people are gonna talk about me yeah. and how they're not. I know what a win would mean and what it wouldn't. Yeah. And I'm okay with being that player. Yeah. And I don't think it's easy for a lot of players to get to that point. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, in, in that respect, I would say that I've been blessed, right, to be able to do some things that 
a lot of people haven't, you know, 30 point games, 40 points, like, you know, however many assists, whatever. And so I, there are things I can point to and say like, hey, advanced stats, say I'm the best in the league at this, I'm the best at that. And so these things that make me elite, whether, you know, mass media knows it or not, I know it. You know what I'm saying? And that is something that I can, I can hold on to and, and continue to show proof, but also have that peace. If I was a player that never got a chance to play, that's a that's a tougher conversation because mm -hmm. now I've never gotten a chance to show success or even to go out there and fail. I've just kind of been in the gray area somewhere. So mm -hmm. I, I think it would be harder if, if that was the case. You know, someone once said to me, we were talking about something else, and they said it's always important that you do this shit out of love and yeah. never for it. Yeah. And I think that for some NBA players, they play basketball for the love. Yeah. And I think that when that's the thing that you're striving for, yeah. it's hard to have that sense of self that, that you're referring to. Exactly. Because success to them is, what do people think about me and my career? There you go. Where success for you is, what do I think about me exactly. and my career? Exactly. And, and did I do the things that, you know what I'm saying, I wanted to do? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do want to experience winning a championship and... I think that fire like his burn even brighter after going to the Western Conference Finals and kind of experiencing that atmosphere. Um, I wanted to be able to take care of my family. I've been able to do that. You know what I'm saying? And I wanted to know internally that I was one of the best to do it. You know what I'm saying? And, and when I say best to do it, I'm not talking top five all the time, but I'm talking about like there's been billions of people on this planet and I could argue that I'm in the top 250 or so to ever yeah. walk the face like of this earth. By definition, by you definition, are one of the best basketball players. Yeah, like how yeah. many people have ever averaged 20 <laughs> points in a season or done this yeah. or done that? It's like I, I could mm -hmm. argue I'm, you know, spitballing top 250 out of the billions of people that ever walked the earth. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's elite. Yeah. No, I like that perspective. You know, when you're talking about, you know, the feeling of being wanted or unwanted, you mentioned Detroit. Yeah. When I was looking stuff up, I saw a quote from Andre Drummond, um, oh, shit. where he said that every time you played Detroit, it felt like you had a personal vendetta against them. Oh, I did. I was about to say, so did you? Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> you can ask Stanley Johnson. Um, when I knew I, was, I wasn't going to be there after my second year, I said, yeah. I'm going to come back and have a game winner against y'all. I told him flat out. I was, I mean, shoot, I was like 22 at the time. I was pissed. Like, I was, you know, hurt mad, sad, like, like I thought, I, I knew I was good enough. I didn't just think I was good enough. I knew I was good enough because I would be killing in practice and like went on my one-on-one -on -one drills and all that other stuff. And so, you know, I didn't know the business of basketball. And then how could I? Nobody in my family had ever been to the NBA. And nobody in my circle had really ever been to the NBA. I didn't, I was ignorant to it. You know what I mean? So um, I just thought, hey, I'm doing my job in practice. I'm showing up early. I've never been late. I've never you know, and, and then you know me, I don't have like many vices off the court or anything like that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just hooping. I'm like, bro, I'm better than these dudes. Like, what's going on? So there was a lot of anger that I held towards the situation. And um, when I said I had released that several years back, it's because I had back to back game winners against them. So <laughs> after that, I was and like, that cured it. Yeah, I was like, all right, fuck it. I'll, I'll leave it alone now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you have any personal vendettas against any team now? Um, no, not now. Um, the, the whole thing, I mean, the only team that it could possibly be would be Dallas, right? But understanding the business of basketball and obviously with it being a, a superstar that asked for a trade and, and understanding my value in, in where I am in the hierarchy and all that other stuff, you know how this thing goes. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a situation where they like, kicked me out the door, said mean things. And they said, look, we love Spence, but we thought this is best for our team. Well, I shake your hand and, you know, agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. So you don't think it was best for the team? No, I'm just saying in general. Like, in general, like yeah, the decision. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, so I'm actually surprised you said that because I think that if most people heard me ask that question, they think that you'd say I have a personal vendetta against the Wizards. The Wizards? So no. let's dive into the Wizards. Oh. Yeah, nah, we, we could definitely do that. We could definitely do that. What happened with Washington? Why do you feel it did not work out for you to be there? Um, I don't think this is just a me thing. So I think um, if you look at 
the way that year started coming together, right? They had a lot of trades, a lot of roster turnover, um, a new head coach trying to figure out an identity, right? Going in several different directions, right? We had Rui coming back from what he was struggling with. Um, Denny was supposed to be like the, you know, second coming of Luka. You know, you got Brad, who's obviously the max guy. You got the Lakers guys coming over who want to establish themselves independently of LeBron. Um, people playing for deals and like all that stuff. And, and it was a situation where, you know, I was just saying like, what are we doing? You know, like you remember, I just I'm coming off injury and I just signed a deal. Mm -hmm. a, a, rather large one, right? So technically speaking, I didn't even need to play, nor was I gonna need to play for a deal, nor did I need money or any of that stuff, right? So it was like, can we just lay out like what the actual plan is? Cause like, you know, I thought I was coming into a situation where I was going to play number two to Brad and Brad was gonna, you know, do his 30 point thing. And then we were gonna try to piece this whole thing together to try to build towards winning, right? Like that's what I was told and that's what I plan on doing. So. But then, like, when the narrative started to get spun, that, like, you know, they were saying I wanted to run the team or whatever else, it was like, bro, like, I didn't even sign here to do that. So you're saying there's no truth to that, that you... No, okay. no. my and, and, you know, my guy who actually got traded with me, Dallas Bertans, like, he'll second all this stuff if you ever want to interview him. But it was, that was my whole sticking point was just what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you can give me clarity, I'll do it. And I think the funny part about it is... Even when I said that back then and everybody tried to spin it, however they tried to spin it and say what they said about me, the last year and a half have shown that. When I got traded to Dallas, first they were saying like, hey, sixth man, we want you to kind of be in that gunner sixth man role. Cool. Okay, now that you're starting to look, we need you to do a little bit more catching and shooting. Fine. Okay, we need you to try to get Christian with the ball a little bit. Cool. Okay, now you're back with Brooklyn. We need you to try to, you know what I'm saying, bring the team together and also look to pass a little bit more. Cool. Like, if you can give me what I need to do, fine. But if we're like, ah, we got eight things we're trying to do. Well, I'm sitting here like, bro, what are, what are we doing? You know, and yeah. we're losing on top of it. You you tell me because do you want me to just sit down since like I'm coming off ACL and <laughs> you guys do whatever you're doing or like you let me know. Mm -hmm. So just for clarification, you're saying that. When you were saying, what are we doing and trying to figure it out, you were vocalizing that to the play, like you were trying to understand. You were yeah. actually asking this yeah. to them. Yeah, I I'll ask the question. Like, and, and not even to the players, like I'll ask the question to the coaches, like, and, and not in a disrespectful manner or saying like, yeah. we can't run this scheme, we can't run. I'm not a dude that dictates schemes or anything like mm -hmm. that. I'm just saying like, give me my clear, concise directions so I can try to do whatever you need me to do to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And and that was the and like I said, the funniest part about how I got kind of bashed out the door was the last year and a half is showing you that I wasn't lying. Because when in Dallas when they told me to like focus on catching and shooting in certain aspects of the game, well I was at one point in time like leading the league in corner three catch and shoot. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? At the beginning of this year. So it's like, look, whatever you give me and, and that's something I actually pride myself on as a basketball player, is having the ability to do all these things. Oh, you need me to catch and shoot for Luca? I'll be one of the best catch and th uh, shoot three point shooters in the league. Oh, you need me to, you know, figure out how to play make for a team that's kind of got thrown together at the trade deadline. I'll be a top five assist type guy in the league. Oh, you need me to ISO at, in a six man role. Um, if you know Luca or JB ain't cooking at night, I'll be the top ISO guy in the league. Like you, let me know. You know what I'm saying it may take me seven eight games to get a handle on it, but You're like, but I'll get there. But I will get there. You tell mm -hmm. me. I got you. So for you, it was just more like you didn't feel like there was clear direction or communication in terms of what your role was going to be within the confines of the system yeah. in Washington. Yeah. Okay. And, and just how we were going to, as a unit, move forward. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like if, if we got a true max guy, which we, we do or did, right? Sorry. Um, and Brad, like, why are we not flowing through him? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I was raised in the league. Like, we got a max guy the same way, like, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And it, Bradley can go for yeah, real. Yeah, yeah. Brad can hoop. Like, <laughs> yeah. So that's why, that's why I said it was, it was so weird when the narrative got spun and, like, I tried to go in there and take over because, it was like, remember, I signed there for a reason. I signed there to play second field to Brad. I didn't sign there to take over the team. That didn't, that didn't make any sense. Like, mm -hmm. he was there, had been there for 
nine years or something at the time, or mm -hmm. eight years at the time, I don't know, something like that. Like, there was no piece of like, oh, I'm coming to take over DC. Like, mm -hmm. it, it was illogical, but it got thrown out there, media ran with it, and that was then the label. Like, yeah. you know, and you know, if that was the case, I would have went to Dallas and tried to take Lucas' spot. Yeah. Well, but, there were like, there were times after where it felt unclear what happened because it felt like there was a time after you played them. It was like you kind of had a jab in the locker room after the game, and then it was like Kuz kind of had a jab. And so we're like, <laughs> what's going on? Does Spencer and Kyle Kuzma not get along? Like, what's the what's the situation? And so um, I think that's how it. Yeah. No. I mean, as far as like me and Kuz, like like nah, we don't really speak, but. We weren't like friends prior to DC or anything like that. Like my friends, you actually know, is Joe Harris, Karis, Jared Allen. It's like a lot of dudes I grew up with in the league. Like yeah. those Brooklyn guys that are really my guys. Um, and then I have cool relationships uh, with you know a lot of different people now, especially some of those Dallas guys, Dwight Powell, Maxi, Josh Green, those type guys, um, and and now Doe obviously too, who came over with me. But the the premise of what I was saying at the time was. We have an MVP in Dallas, mm -hmm. right? Potential MVP. Which, are you finally reading the quote so that people listening oh, yeah, yeah, understand? On, so this is the quote. I said, Mr. FaceTime. The quote was, they're not playing for nothing for real. It's a showcase. They're over there trying to get paid, not trying to play winning basketball. And that caused a bit of a stir. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I stand by. Like, at the end of the day, like, if I, here's the thing. You know me. I'm a very honest dude. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to say something, especially in the media, and I've thought about my words, I'm gonna stand on what I said. Like I'm, I'm not a guy that's gonna be like, "Oops, oh no, I didn't mean that." Remember, it goes back to my time there. If there's a lack of clarity on what we should be doing, well, then naturally, right, a human being is gonna say, "Well, I'm gonna carve out my little piece of this so I can get mine." Like that's how it happens. Like if there's no, no clear like that we're doing X, Y, Z. Well, then yeah, like think about it. Like let's say, let's say in Dallas we. Let's go to the West Conference Finals uh, team, right? You knew Luca was going to come out and do his thing. JB was going to come out and do his thing. And if one of them were kind of off, well, then I was going to come out and try to, you know what I'm saying, do my thing. And if both of them were on, well, I was probably a catch-and-shoot guy. Everybody else, rebound, defend, you know what I'm saying, whatever your role, maybe energy, whatever your role was, you did it. But let's say, like, we didn't have direction. Well, then maybe Maxie decides he wants to shoot 15 times that day. Maybe Dwight Powell decides he wants to bring the ball up. Maybe, you know, like it, it, would, it would just be random. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And when you are in a situation like that, well, people start doing random things. And so that's what you've seen over the course of the last year and a half or so with them. So. And, and then the, the problem with where we were at in Dallas at the time was if we have an MVP and we're trying to get back to the conference finals where we were, because that was relatively early in the season, um, we can't lose to a team that's not in that same level of like aspirations. They're not trying to do the same things. They don't have the same goals. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like if you go to Milwaukee and lose because Giannis has 50, are we really that upset about it? Like, no, probably not. Like, you know, he had a night, and MVP had a night, another championship caliber team had a night. But, like, we needed to start winning the games that we needed to win. Like, we had a, a game early in the season where we were up, like, 20 in the fourth to OKC and lost. You know, there were, there were a lot of kind of moments, and that's what that quote was behind, was where the Dallas team was at the time, where we needed to focus, and then also understanding how it kind of functions in DC. It was less so a like specific shot because I don't really had no beef with nobody in the NBA. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, you know me, I go home and I be chilling. I don't really even see these dudes in the summer for real. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I, I get up at six at 5 a.m. and train and yeah. twice a day and all that other stuff. And mm -hmm. then if I decide to play pickup, I go see him. But other than that, I'm back with my son before these dudes are waking yeah. up. Like, You're like, it's not a beef thing. And yeah, yeah. to be clear, I mean, Bradley's great. He's yeah. good on the show. I think he's a great player. I think he is the nicest human. Kuz is my friend. I think Kuz is great as well. So I understand that you're like, this is really just like a basketball thing that, yeah. that you're speaking to. But did it bother you that that narrative was out there about you in terms of, I just feel like it was, the narrative was sort of that you were Wyatt and it worked. 
Did that bother you? Of course. Yeah. Of course, because I knew, I knew it wasn't true. Um, mm -hmm. But again, this is the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. You need scapegoats sometimes. You need to have places that you put blame, mm -hmm. and it's an easy target. You could. Uh, talk about my outspoken nature. You could talk about brutal honesty. You could talk about the fact I was coming off injury. You could talk about you could you can always pick things about people the same way you could pick positive things. Mm -hmm. um, so they they pick some things that you know you could take negative and mm -hmm. you live with it. Well, now you've cleared it up. Look there at that. There we go. There we go. The importance of speaking. Hey, on your show. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, shifting gears a little bit. Describe your relationship with NBA referees in one word. <laughs> Tumultuous. <laughs> Why is it tumultuous? Um, I mean, obviously, everybody knows about what happened early in the season, so I'm not really talking about that. I think, um, you know, I want to win. And so if there's a, a play that I feel like puts me at a disadvantage of winning the game, that is, you know, factually incorrect, then I have a reaction to it. Um, overall, right, it's a, it's a cumulative thing too, so you can't get caught up with everything in a vacuum and understand that if it continues to build and it could harm you even more long term. And so it's, it's a balancing act because if you're quiet, sometimes it gets worse too because they're like, ah, we're just gonna keep coming at them. And so it really is kind of this fine line of like, hey, yo, that wasn't correct. I need you to watch out for this. I got to talk to you. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to have a reaction. But also I can't be, you know, over the top to where it's deemed disrespectful or counterproductive uh, to the group as a whole. So so you're balancing, okay, when do I talk to them and when do I not? Yeah. Do you ever feel like you're talking to them too much? Do you feel like you're talking to them when it feels right? And maybe it's just it feels right a lot of the time? Um, I, I think that's the, the, the hard part about uh, being emotional, right? Like mm -hmm. I put my heart and soul into this. And so there's a certain emotion um, that's tied into it and the fans wouldn't like it if I didn't have emotion tied to this and I didn't care about winning. Um, I, I do know that there are times though that I do it too much. Um, and like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, and then it's also highlighted with having a little bit younger team and needing to kind of, or younger in terms of the team being put together and needing to kind of show a little bit more resolve and leadership versus, you know, being in possibly some other different situations where it's like, hey, like, I can go at them three or four times, but, you know, it's, it's going to be perceived differently. Okay, so obviously I don't want you to get fined. I'm not asking you to criticize or anything yeah. like that. But what do you want to see from refs? Oh, um, I would say personally, first and foremost, I think the, the main thing is, like, I hope that they know that the players understand that their job ain't easy. You know, I think um, a lot of times the reactions happen while we're also emotional too, right? Whether it be a missed call or it be a lost game or a tech or ejection or something, you know, we lose money, et cetera. And then, yeah, rightfully so, we're upset with you, right? Um, I think they need to also understand that like we do know that they got the heart one of the hardest jobs in the world right bang bang plays we're moving at high speeds like you're not gonna get everything right so players are cognizant of that and when we have those reactions like we're we're speaking to the stripes we're not speaking to the person and so i think sometimes uh if it does come off disrespectful and they have an emotional reaction back then it just it builds and now you got two you know prideful people you know, they're at the top of their crafts going at each other and, and then nobody wants to yield. So I would say that that dynamic is probably one where that would be my only correction for them just because inherently their job is to be not emotional. I know it's hard as a human being, mm -hmm. but that is part of their job description. You know what I'm saying? So even if we come at you with some emotion, your job description is still no emotion, and that's hard. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not easy, and it's an unenviable position, but it is, you know what I'm saying, your job. Like mm -hmm. You're saying that, you're almost saying, like, the burden of being even killed is not on me. It's on you. Technically speaking, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. that's part of it. You know what I'm saying? Because you're, you're the one that's 
impartial and unbiased and all those stuff. I'm biased. I'm biased to the Nets. I'm biased to Spencer every single night. <laughs> every yeah. single night. I am biased to the Nets. I'm biased to Spencer. So if Mikael gets fouled, I'm on it. If Nick, you know what I'm saying, shouldn't have got a travel call, I'm on it. Right? And yes, I need to approach you with respect to build goodwill and good faith over the course of this game, over the course of the season, over the course of long term. At the same time, if I have an emotional reaction, you still, by definition, yeah. can't be emotional. Because mm -hmm. if the Nets are playing the Cavs, you can't have emotion one way or the other. Um, but I just, I just, you know, my message to them would just be like, I want them to know that players in general, and I'm not just speaking for myself, mm -hmm. we understand their job ain't easy. Like, yeah. we completely understand that, especially when you have these style conversations in a removed place, you know what I'm saying, where it's not immediately post-game when we lost. And they're like, what do you think? Well, they shot 15 more free throws. What do you think I think? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But removed, I'm like, nah, like, I understand your job's hard. Like, I'm not sitting here, like, saying it's easier that y'all are the worst in the world. We understand y'all at the top of y'all craft the same way I'm at the top of mine. Mm -hmm. No, I love that answer. And I'm also, I'm not asking you to, to dive into what happened with you earlier in the season, but did you ever get a chance to speak to that ref one-on-one? -on -one? Nah. Okay. Do nah, you have I, any desire to? Not really. Okay. Not really. But I assume you've seen him since. Nope. Okay. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Got it. I just wanted to check and see if we, anything was able to uh, be resolved. Nah. Um, I was watching the Nets game against the Thunder when you didn't like the lack of a call from a ref and you very audibly yelled. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, I've never seen Spencer angry or yeah. mad before. Yeah. What's the most angry you've ever been on the basketball court? Oh, that, that might have been one of them. <laughs> okay, I, besides that one. <laughs> uh... I, I don't know, but I got a, I got a story for how that kind of went down and why I did. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, some of the very small outbursts or uh, whatever is kind of like blowing off some steam. Like you got a teapot or whatever, you let off some steam, right? Um, so I had, I had had a couple people come up to me like, look, I just need you to be quiet the entire game. A couple so, people meaning Nets teammates? Uh, like a, a teammate, my mom, like just some people. <laughs> okay. was like, and I was like, all right, whatever. We on a little winning streak. I'll be quiet during the OKC game. So things are starting to stack up. And I'm like, all right. I already know. Like, <laughs> they've been hacking. I'm like, bro, like, y'all really playing with me right now. They, they testing me right now. So um, we had like a lead and it's kind of, you know, going south and they had fouled a couple of times, whatever, and I'm still kind of keeping it chill. Um, and so they kind of take the lead, take control of the game. And um, so now obviously, like I gotta kind of get a little more aggressive, start attacking. And that specific player right there was so blatantly a foul. Like it, was, it wasn't even remotely close, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I've been kind of getting like smug looks and stuff from the refs because the refs that even actually heard one of our conversations was like, wow, so no complaint, you know what I'm saying, before <laughs> for the game. So he's talking and stuff, and I'm thinking like, all right, whatever. Like, oh, this is a big deal, huh, Spencer being quiet. Okay. Spencer not going to talk yeah, to us today. Whatever. Oh, like, right, the cool. pigs fly. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, all right, whatever, bro. So, all right, you in a good mood? Cool. Uh, let me give me a couple calls. Um, <laughs> so that one was so obviously a foul, and with everything that had gone on, the fact that we had lost the lead, the game was kind of now getting out of hand, and because it was, it felt like they were playing in my face because of like the pregame joke and like all the other stuff and blah blah. So that's why I was just, I, I was, I had it with like the the entire situation, and I was like, listen, I'd rather just do me and get a tech here or there. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I, it's not like I got 18 of them and I'm leaving. I'm just the do me, get a tech. <laughs> no, I'm saying I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather. Go back to, you know what I'm saying, the the other stuff and and, yeah. and keep being more level-headed and also mm -hmm. at least feeling like I'm defending myself to a degree because I've never been somebody that was just like turn the other cheek. Like yeah. that wasn't that wasn't the way I was raised. My dad was raised me to be like, yo, like don't start nothing, but if they start something, you finish it. And so mm -hmm. that's the way I take things. Like most chill do in the world, but if you start it, like – oh, we can go wherever you want to go with it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how I live life. Yeah. And so it's very hard to, like, turn that off when for 29 years I've lived life in that manner. Like, oh, we're, where are we going with this? I will go wherever and further. Period. <laughs> further. Period. Like, that's, yeah. 
I mean, shit, that's that's how my career has been able to survive. You know what I'm saying? We talk about work, we talk about So it's basketball. almost like your reflex. That's the reflex. Yeah. And so it, it very rarely actually takes me out of the game because it's a reflex and then it's done. It's part of who I've been the entirety of my life. I get, though, that the perception is that, like, I go somewhere off a whole nother planet and I'm disruptive to the team. And, like I said, when you're with a more veteran team, it doesn't really affect the other guys. Like, you know, I'm doing that, okay, Dwight Powell and Maxi probably ain't tripping. You know what I'm saying? But if now I'm the more core leader of this versus a, you know, peripheral leader mm -hmm. and we are in a new situation, okay, well, now I have to tone that down and kind of restructure my reactions. But I'm doing that for the good of the group, not just being quiet and getting slapped in the face. Mm -hmm. So I can put what I want to the side for the good of the unit, and I will do that at any point in time because the unit is what matters and winning is what matters. But if I'm just sitting here being quiet and y'all just playing with me, <laughs> I ain't, I ain't, so, ain't going to work too well. <laughs> so right now the word we're using to describe relationship with the refs is tumultuous. What word would you like it to be? What word are we looking to end on? Amicable. Amicable. Amicable, cordial. Yeah, cordial. Okay, that's good. It. That's that's, that's going to be our goal. That's the goal for 2024. <laughs> yes, for 2024. Shit. New year, new me. Um, you spoke to Forbes about coaching, and you had a great quote that I want to recite to you. You said, to me, coaching at this level, it's 80% psychologists, 10% temperament, 10% X's and O's. Yeah. It's mostly about managing the egos. Yeah. When has that stance and opinion been the most clear to you? Shoot. Nets, probably. Mm -hmm. um, seeing the transition that we went from, you know, young upstarts that kind of had their quirks to then championship expectations with, you know what I'm saying, the guys and everything. It's just, you know, even there's only been, what, 5,000 or so NBA players in history. Uh, like we said, there's been billions and billions of people on the planet. We're all elite. We're all going to think we're the best. We're all going to have all this stuff. But to try to get, you know, a nine-man rotation to buy into a role function as one when they may have been, you know, they say Pat Bev was like a 35-point a game scorer in high school. You know what I'm saying? Now, like, we leave him open, you know what I'm saying, sometimes because it's like, oh, we want him shooting more than we want Zach Levine shooting. Is that an indictment on him or his talent? Not really. It's just that's how we're going to play. And so you got to get all these egos in check for them to work together. And then it's like, for example, credit to him. He'll still make the extra pass to Zach so Zach can still get his shot. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. And, and that's really what the NBA is about. Um, at the end of the day, you know, roster construction is going to have a much bigger indicator on whether you're going to win a championship than X and O's. Like, mm -hmm. X and O's steal you, you know, maybe four to six points, you know what I'm saying, eight points maybe. But, like, if I got the 2017 or 18 Warriors, hey, listen, bro. Like, <laughs> You're like, we good. We, we, winning a lot of, <laughs> yeah. we winning a lot of games. Like, yeah. we're winning a lot of games. No, yeah. no shot at Steve Kerr, and he just won a title with a lesser team. But I'm just saying, in those specific situations, because I know everything gets clickbaity and hot takey and all of yeah. that stuff, like, I'm not talking about bad about nobody. Yeah, you're just saying there was a crazy good yeah, that team, was a, that crazy was a, roster. That was an insane yeah. roster that was going to win mm -hmm. if you were their coach. Yeah. Like, Excuse me. No, just I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so you use the Nets as an example. Mm -hmm. If this was, you know, you put on your coaching cap for a day, mm -hmm. how would you have managed those egos on the Nets? The reason why I brought up um, the Nets was because I was a part of it and I watched some of it, but I also watched a lot of it from afar because when I got hurt, I did go to LA and, you know, participated in my whole training schedule and then I went to DC. So to say what I would do differently, I, I can't really answer that because I wasn't in the day to day mm -hmm. and see all the little pieces. I was like, there from like day one to day like five, but day five to day 100, mm. I missed it. Well, what general role do you think ego plays in the NBA as a whole? No, it's huge. Mm. It's huge. I, I would say for the most part, it's everything, right? Because you need your stars to 
have insanely huge egos and confidence and all that other stuff because they got to be able to take the last shot and they got to be able to do these things at a high level every single night. A certain amount of mental toughness is just, you know, 82 games a lot. Yeah. You know, and then you have to have guys four through 15 put their egos completely to the side. You know what I'm saying? And maybe not play tonight or maybe play or all that other stuff and still cheer on the bench and still be, you know, bring positive energy and good vibes. So it's this like crazy dual dynamic where like one through three have to believe in themselves to an insane degree and four through 15 have to say, they have to acquiesce to one through three and put their pride on the side. But then if somebody in the one through three gets hurt, somebody gonna have to step up and then flip the switch and become one of those. It's the the psychological battle that the NBA is is why a lot of people don't make it. Like there's yeah. people overseas that I know are talented enough to play in the league. Like there's probably, you know, another 100, 200 guys that probably could be in the NBA, mm -hmm. but but it was that mental element. Yeah, they're probably they're just not cut for it for real. Mm -hmm. But if you put them on a basketball floor, they could could they play with us for sure. Yeah. Who's the most egoless NBA star? Oh, star? Ah. Uh, I don't know. I thought you were going to say just player. Anthony Gill, by far. Wizards teammate. He is the most <laughs> quality human being that I've ever met in the National Basketball Association, bar none. Is Anthony, okay. Well, Anthony. From, for, okay, I'll say, because I feel like you've seen a lot. You've been around a lot mm -hmm. of teams. You've played with stars. Are you saying, because this is my thing with ego. I get it's hard to manage. I understand there's this major psychological element in the NBA, but you could argue that that ego is one of the things you need to be one of those you have to. stars or superstars or whatever. Like it's necessary to. to the stardom yeah. in some way. And ego isn't bad, right? Like no. I don't think ego has to be some negative thing. It's like it's either a, a, a very strong belief in yourself or it's the belief that no one is better than you at yeah. this thing or this belief that just your pride is not going to be her. And if it is, it's not going to be because of something that you did to me on this basketball exactly. court, you know? I think that you actually need that to be able to propel to that spot. 1, in the NBA in general, really. 1,000%. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, my, my career is a testament to that, right? If I was a more mentally fragile human being or I didn't have an, an ego that, although realistic, had its insane belief, I wouldn't be here. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be able to, like, like sincerely, when I step on the floor, I don't believe that anybody can guard me. And I said that when I was, you know, back in 2017 and got laughed at and all that stuff. But, like, why, why would I come into this game thinking that you could stop me? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're going to have to show me that you can. And, and not just show me once, like, consistently over and over and over. Now, I get the dynamics of the business. And so if I have... You know, Luca next to me, I understand he's shooting 20 times, I'm shooting 10. It is what it is. It's the business, and that's how our team's going to run, and that's what's best for our team. Mm -hmm. But don't think in those 10 attempts that, like, I'm thinking you're going to stop this. Like, nah. <laughs> yeah. Nah. I'm... Absolutely. And that's how you have to be. Yeah. Well, okay, speaking of stars, speaking of Luca, what do spectators not understand about Luca's game that someone who is his teammate now understands about his game and just how um, special he is? Athletically speaking, he's a lot quicker than, than people think. They think because he, the way his body looks and stuff that he has zero athleticism. That's not the case. He's actually very strong and he's very quick. He's not necessarily fast, though. Um, I think the other thing, too, about the, the timing and pace of his game is extremely tricky. Like, Anybody that plays at one speed all the time, you start to pick up a cadence. It's almost like a song, right? And if you can catch the like the beat, you can start to time it, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of things that he does that is just it's just off. It's like southpaw, right? It's just off like typical NBA timing. Like some of his passes that he throws are just like super late, mm -hmm. you know. And and that's hard for you to get used to unless you see it every single day. So as a teammate, you start to pick up on like, oh, this is what he's doing. But when you see him twice a year, you're like, what the hell did he just do? Like, how did he do this? You yeah, know what I mean? That works um, to his advantage. And it that works it is to his so advantage. kind of off kilter. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that, along with his obviously phenomenal basketball IQ, is what makes him so special. Mm -hmm. And, like, what is Luca's personality? Is he funny? Is he serious? Is he quiet? Is he a t like, I don't. What does Luca act mean, like? 
What does he act like? I mean, he's just a cool dude. He's, yeah. he's fairly chill, but he's got, he got his jokes. He's funny. He's around the guys and stuff. He's not like, you know, off to the side or like some weird emo guy or something like that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think he was yeah. emo. But no, I've seen, I'm always like, okay, is he like a jokester or? And yeah, I really play, know. yeah, he plays a little jokes and stuff. Yeah. He's, he's just a, just a good guy. Like, he's a good dude. Okay, perfect. Last uh, kind of section for you. Obviously, Spencer, you are someone I've known for a long time. Mm -hmm. I know you well. On this show, I like to give people the opportunity to talk about things that are special to them and mean something to them. Um, so I want to give you a chance to talk about how special your grandma was to you um, and just what she meant to your overall life. Oh, man. Uh, you got me with that one. Uh, I think... My grandma was probably the place that I felt the most authentic and, and truest love in my life. And that's why, that's a relationship that, I mean, quite honestly, I don't really talk about much. Um, she, uh, you know, there's expectations that, that come with other relationships. And, and I mean, that like my dad and you know, mom and stuff, and, and they love me to death. They take a bullet for me. But, you know, whether it be wanting me to score or wanting me to be good at this or stuff, it, with my grandmother, it was just about, like, just being me. Like, I was, I was enough, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's, uh, that, that's, that is like, uh, sorry, you, you really got me, but that's, it's, it's such a unique thing to feel. And I, th I think that everybody at some point in time in their life, I hope that they have a relationship that's like that, where especially in your formative years as a kid, you just, your smile, you can tell that your smile changes their day and their smile changes your day and that mm -hmm. you two just sitting with each other regardless of whatever it is, it was, it was just enough for that day. Mm -hmm. So, that was, that was my girl, man. Yeah. What do you feel like your grandma loved the most about you? She loved the most. I think um, she's probably one of the only people that's experienced like uh, the the warmth in my heart that I that I probably tuck away more than I should. Um, you you got really real in this conversation oh, to end it. Nah, 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 it's, it's cool. Uh, yeah. Cause yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it'd be easy to say like intelligence or like our jokes and stuff like that. Cause we used to joke about all types of shit. But I think, um, especially as a kid, like, that's that's what I remember mo most, like the warmth, the embrace. I think we knew what each other was thinking a lot of times. Um, like when I'd sit with her, you know what I'm saying, before she passed, like we just kind of could just sit there together, you know what I'm saying? And, and uh, yeah, no, I mean, not to get into any like real specific stories because the, the, two, the two things that actually uh, – can make me cry are my son and my grandma. So like, if I start getting the stories, it might get a little get a little awkward on the show. So that's you can feel whatever you <laughs> want to feel on the show. No, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, yesterday, actually, my grandma got out of the hospital. She's fine. She's healthy. Um, but I actually thought about conversations that we had had about your grandma when she was in there because you just think to yourself all the time, like, your grandparents are these people that love you so much, and it is so important to just call them. Yeah and talk to them. Yeah. And like when we had people in our lives that like we literally only exist because they were alive, so exactly. they've always been in our lives. We don't know what it's like to not have them there all the time. Yeah. And we, because of that, we then take it for granted that they're yeah. there all of the time. Um, so just for now watching, I just hope this is a reminder to call your parents, call your grandparents if you are blessed enough to have all those people. Um, you gotta make me wanna cry. Blessed enough to have all those people I got on the planet. More on that too. Yeah. Um, you know, when she when she was sick, I never missed a day sitting with her. And I think that 
you know, when what happened happened, that was something that, that gave me peace. So as you said to, to people in kind of a little call to action, like I I would have so much regret if that if I didn't treat that situation like I did, even though it it wasn't fun to see her the way that, you know what I'm saying, she would be sometimes, like knowing what those moments meant to her and then obviously like the regret that I don't feel, that was uh that was huge. So yeah. for 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 the people if you're going through something like mm -hmm. take that extra moment. For sure. And I love that you're like you were able to be peaceful because you know that she meant she knew what she meant to you yeah. and you knew what she meant to her because you all had those conversations. I do want to ask though just because I, I thought it was beautiful that you said that how did your relationship with your grandma influence the way that you parent Elijah? <laughs> uh, man, I would say that being with her and knowing what I love so much about that relationship, I've tried to have a standard for, for excellence that probably came from my parents, but less uh, expectation or qualification on it, and more so just trying to be like, yo, like, you're you're enough. You know, like, you are whatever you choose to be, NASA, basketball, whatever. Like, I don't, I'm not pushing to play basketball, none of that stuff. I hope he does. No, <laughs> you're like, let's around. be clear. I hope he does. <laughs> um, I, think, I think that's... Uh, and, and I kiss him a lot. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's something that prior, if you had if you had asked me if I, when I was 21, like if I'd kiss my son a ton, I'd probably be like, nah. Mm -hmm. But like that's something that I do all the time. I kiss him all the time, and I just try to reiterate that he's enough, and you know that my love for him isn't predicated on success or failure or anything like that. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Truly. No problem. I think it's it's genuinely important. I'm happy that. Everyone got to at least know a piece of how special she was um, and what, what she meant to your life. Um, we always end these with a what if question. Mm -hmm. It's about basketball. But what if you could perfect one move on the court? What is it? Just one? Just one. Oh, I'd be able to shoot threes from half court at like a... Uh, 90 like an insane clip. Yeah, like a like a 90% <laughs> clip. Yeah, you got to pick me up at half court, buddy. I'm firing it. Yeah. I mean, that is the way this thing is evolving. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's going to be able to happen. In at first, I was going to say sky ago. hook, but then I was like, ah, that kind of sucks. <laughs> You're like, that's lame, man. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's lame. <laughs> no, I love that. Okay, so you would just be chucking him up. And oh, for sure. Him. Half court, just 70% clip. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. No, truly. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your openness, your honesty, your perspective on all of the things, both basketball related and not. I'm glad we got to finally do this. So yeah. thank you for stopping by and, and coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.